Okie dokie, let's get started. Hush creature. Okay. <laughs> Alrighty, good morning everybody. Let's go ahead and... Um, I guess we can go ahead and go right through it. Um, so the exam average was really quite high, uh, which is awesome. Uh, you guys, are, I think, were about 87%, which is pretty absurd. So um, either you are learning really well or you're cheating really well. Um, <laughs> can't really uh, distinguish that here, of course, but uh, nice job. So uh, you should be happy about that. So uh, does anybody have any questions about that for whatever reason? Um, just so we know, uh, the uh, you guys, you will still have a homework assignment this week that's going to be like going over uh, things you got wrong again, uh, just like we did last time. Uh, and uh, so you'll have that for every exam, basically. Um, one thing I did want to bring up is I think uh, on the syllabus, I have your next exam in two weeks. Uh, I think that's a bit crazy. So um, I will probably make that about three weeks away instead. Um, so because I copied that schedule from last semester. So um, this one, for whatever reason, uh, I think it would be better to have it in three weeks instead. So I will send out an email to the class so everybody can be aware of that. So um, just so you know, so that is a change on the, the schedule of things. So uh, it's supposed to cover uh, these next three chapters, which are intermolecular forces, gases, and solutions. Um, we're going to have all of those topics on our exam. <coughs> Creature, shush. You don't need to be naughty. Okay. All right. Well, let's go ahead and get started then. So um, this chapter, chapter six, uh, we'll be talking about intermolecular forces. So um, if we want to uh, take a look at this word, we're going to see that it has, you know, two components. We have this inter part and the molecular part. We're going to see, of course, inter means between. Uh, and, of course, molecular means something to do with molecules, right? So uh, this uh, chapter we're going to be focusing on uh, forces that are existing between molecules. So um, previously, let's do previously in green. We have learned intramolecular forces. And intra, if we take a look at that, that is within molecules. And so those would be, you know, ionic bonds, covalent bonds, you know, that sort of thing. Covalence, rather. No, covalent bonds. Oh, by the way, um, just so you know, because undoubtedly you will ask this, um, we're not going to have electron configurations on our next exam, um, but we will have, uh, there will definitely be Lewis structures we're going to see, um, as well as, what was the other thing we did? Oh, naming. Of course, yeah, naming you're going to need for the rest of the semester and for the rest of your chemistry. So, uh, for sure. Okay. So uh, we've previously talked about intramolecular forces. Um, so we just spent a uh, you know a week or two on bonding. Um, and so now we're going to talk about ones that are in between molecules. So uh, this kind of stuff was like how atoms are connected to each other in molecules. Now we're going to see how two molecules or more interact with each other. And we're going to see, by the way, um, Intermolecular forces is uh, often abbreviated IMF. 
Um, so you'll see me uh, abbreviating that pretty often just because nobody wants to write intermolecular all these times, you know. So intermolecular forces, um, these are these vary in strength. Uh, and so these are forces, right? So they are um, things that are going to influence how they uh, behave. So we're going to see that some of them will have uh, pretty strong influences on how the molecules are behaving, and some will be pretty weak. Uh, we're going to actually go from weakest to strongest, um, which is not quite the order that it's presented in the book, but that's okay. Um, doesn't really matter which order these are presented in. Uh, and we're going to have four of them overall, uh, at least for this class. So um, the first one, which is the weakest, um, is what is known as a London dispersion force. Um, these are also sometimes called Van der Waals forces. Uh, they're interchangeable. Um, these, this will be the only one that has kind of a weird name. Uh, so these are both named after two scientists. Uh, London is one scientist and Van der Waal is another one. Um, they both kind of discovered this kind of at the same time. So they're both kind of given credit for it. Okay, so um, we're going to see that anything yeah, with electrons will undergo this force. And of course, uh, we know that since atoms are made, you know, typically have electrons, right? Uh, unless it's like an H plus ion, but by and large, everything has electrons. Um, and so uh, we're going to see that every single thing uh, in our chemistry universe here can undergo these London dispersion forces. And these are also kind of the, the most um, bizarre, most abstract ones. Um, but let's take a look at, at what the, how these work. So let's pretend we have an atom here. And for simplicity, instead of drawing a kajillion orbitals and all that fun stuff, we're just going to have an atom. And let's just say the electrons just happen to be, you know, floating around in here. They're all going different directions, zooming, zipping, zipping around. Um, and here we can see that we have electrons that are well distributed. Um, this is kind of the, the normal, you know, 99.99% of the time. They're just, you know, they just happen to be zipping around and there we go, we have a fairly even spread. But that 0.01% I didn't mean to make these like different shapes. But that's okay. And so sometimes just by chance, because all these electrons are just zipping around in here, um, occasionally uh, you'll end up with just, you know, at a particular instant of time, uh, you may have an uneven distribution of electrons. Uh, and so maybe just for, you know, no reason, but just instantaneously, a bunch of electrons just happen to be on the left side of that molecule there. Um, and so we're going to see that this ends up making this kind of side of the atom super, super, super partially negative, just a little bit. The two deltas there mean it's like a really small partial charge. Um, and as a result, 
we're going to have a very, very, very slight positive on the other side. And this is just for a particular atom, right? So just one atom, the electrons just happen to be more on one side. What's interesting, though, is this uneven distribution. can induce another atom to do the same. What's going to happen is now this other atom nearby is, you know, kind of understand so this is our original atom right we had it slightly negative slightly positive our neighboring atom next door um will kind of be looking over and say hey what's going on over there you know why are those electrons all gathered on that side let me take a look and as a result we're going to end up having just another uneven distribution that's caused by the first one and so as a result, this one becomes, I'm sorry, that's slightly negative, not positive. And that's going to kind of cause this interaction in between these two. So um, we're going to see that just randomly, 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 no reason behind it, uh, all the electrons in an atom may at one point just happen to be on one side of the molecule or atom rather, and that can cause a very, very slight uh, charge. And as a result, that charge can induce another atom to also have its electrons kind of clustered on one side. Um, and so this only lasts for a fraction of a second, you know, you know, like these, these electrons in the second atom are kind of looking over, hey, what's going on over there? Oh, nothing interesting. And then they just go off and do their own thing again. So this lasts just a tiny amount of time. This is very weak and it's short lasting. Naughty creature, come here. <laughs> He doesn't like these uh, London dispersion forces. They're too weak for him. So um, we can call this, and we have a fun, crazy term for it. We can call these induced. Or actually, let me say instantaneous first. Um, so it's instantaneous uh, in that it just happens at one time and poof, it's done. You know, that, that's kind of it. Uh, it can induce, that means like kind of force something else to happen. Uh, it can induce another atom to do the same thing. Uh, and it kind of forms this little dipole. So a dipole, die two poles, right? We have a positive pole and a negative pole kind of here. Um, and so... Uh, that's how we're going to classify these ones. All right, and so anything that has electrons can do this, but uh, the more electrons you have, the stronger this gets. Uh, as you can imagine, you know, the more electrons that you have clustered on one side, that's going to make your negative charge a little bit stronger uh, and therefore your positive charge a little bit stronger as well. Uh, and, and, you know, that's kind of how the trend goes. So the more um, uh, electrons that you have in your atom or your molecule overall, this could be a total molecule overall as well. Um, just typically we illustrate it with atoms just because it's easier to draw. But um, we're going to see that the more electrons you have, the stronger your forces are going to get. Okay, so uh, we're going to see that this is the primary 
intermolecular force for nonpolar molecules. Uh, and we're going to see why that is uh, when we take a look at polar molecules instead. All right, any questions on that one? Uh, what we're going to basically be doing today, uh, if you guys have questions, go ahead and write them out or, or whatever. Um, we're going we're gonna to learn the, the four forces, and then after that, we're going to try and predict what the forces that a particular molecule can undergo. Uh, so that's what we're going to be doing after. So for right now, we're just learning what the forces are, and then we'll talk about uh, you know, how we're going to predict it and the... Um, kind of the uh, implications of these forces. Okay, so I'm not seeing anything, so let's go to our next one. Uh, the next one will be called dipole-dipole interactions. And I'm gonna tell you right now, this is gonna be polar molecules only. Uh, and we're going to see why that is. So let's take a look at a uh, Lewis structure we've already done. Uh, we remember that, uh, or actually if you just look at the periodic table, you'll see chlorine is to the right of sulfur, meaning chlorine is more electronegative. So chlorine is going to have the minus charges, partial charges that is, and sulfur will have a uh, partial positive charge. Uh, we also sometimes draw little arrows to indicate this, just to show uh, kind of where the electrons are going. And so uh, we often put this um, now let me do a different color for that actually. Let's use light blue. Yeah. This uh, arrow represents what is called a dipole moment. This is the plus side, this is the negative side. Uh, so the plus side has the little oh. plus on it. Basically it's kind of that little notch in the uh, arrow there. Um, and so we, we kind of illustrate a dipole as um, in this manner using the, the dipole moment. Alrighty, and I don't know if any of you remember your vectors from geometry class or from physics or whatever, but if we add those two green ones up, if we add the two green vectors up there, what this actually looks like is overall the molecule is got a positive half kind of at the top and a negative half at the bottom. Uh, we can kind of see that. Let me redraw the molecule. I mean, we, we already could tell this one is polar, right? We have... Uh, lone pairs. I mean, that's one way to know right away. We can also kind of think about it this way. So we kind of have a positive half of the molecule, if we were to cut it in half, and we kind of have a negative half of the molecule, right? Because those chlorines are pulling the electrons away from sulfur, so they are pulling it towards themselves. Um, and so overall, we have a polar molecule, right? And uh, something that has poles obviously has, you know, opposites, right? Our planet has a north pole and a south pole, right? Those are magnetic poles. Uh, here we have electrical poles. So uh, we have a positive half and a negative half. Uh, and so uh, we're going to see here that this uh, can attract...
things that are negative, the plus half of this molecule. And we can see that this part can attract positive things. And so, let's take a look at another molecule. It's okay, they have to see another molecule. Let's take a look at this guy, carbon monoxide. Which one's more electronegative, carbon or oxygen? I'm going to put you down, okay? Uh -huh. Which one's more electronegative? Yeah, for sure. Oxygen is definitely more electronegative. Uh, so, we can see here that the oxygen in this molecule is going to try and hog the electrons as well. Um, and so, I mean, this one's a pretty, pretty obvious again, like kind of split. You know, this is our negative half of the molecule. This is our positive half of the molecule. And so if we were to try and look at these two put together, then uh, we can go ahead and look at that. So how would sulfur dichloride and carbon monoxide interact? Well, we can see both of these molecules are polar, right? They each have a positive side and a negative side. And of course, we know that uh, for electrostatics, opposites attract. So we might see something like this. I'm going to be kind of naughty and uh, not do my lone pairs right now, but don't forget your lone pairs. Alrighty, so we saw that the sulfur half of this molecule was the positive side, and the chlorines were kind of the negative side. And we also saw in carbon monoxide that carbon was the positive and oxygen was the negative. So we might see something like this. Ignoring the lone pairs we might see a kind of interaction here between the negative oxygen and the positive sulfur. So this is what that dipole, dipole interaction looks like. So this is a positive and negative of two different molecules uh, interacting. They're, they're attracting each other, right? Uh, so the oxygen being slightly negative is uh, kind of happy to see the positive sulfur there, uh, and so they're going to kind of just mingle. And so, because these are like actual dipoles, so like with the London forces, those were just kind of, you know, fake dipoles. You know, it existed for a fraction of a time and it was very weak. Uh, this is a little bit stronger. So we have, in these, we have permanent dipoles now. So we don't have instantaneous dipoles that kind of are short lasting and they go away. These ones are permanent dipoles, right? Carbon monoxide is always polar. Um, and so we're going to see that those can interact with each other. And uh, just so we know, this could have happened the other way as well. We could have had we could have had, uh, you know, maybe the carbon now interacting with the chlorines. Remember, the chlorines were slightly negative and our carbon was slightly positive. This would also have uh, 
could be a potential situation for how these would have interacted. So we just kind of want to make sure that our positive and negatives are uh, happily interacting with each other. So we don't want to, for example, flip that carbon monoxide over because that would put the negatives, negative oxygen near the negative chlorines. That's not going to be a, a good thing. Those are, are going to repel from each other, right? If we want them to attract each other, uh, we need them to be the opposite uh, charges. Alrighty, um, any questions on that one? So of course this is for polar molecules only. Let me just write that again. And so this is why uh, you're still going to need to know your Lewis structures for this next exam, because uh, you will not be able to tell us something's polar without knowing your Lewis structures. So just to, to recap, we've talked about two of them so far. Uh, the first one, anything can do. Nonpolar molecules, polar molecules, single atoms, anything that has electrons can do London dispersion forces. Uh, however, for this dipole interaction, uh, it's only polar molecules. Okay? So this is kind of medium in strength. See if I can figure out how to spell medium. There we go. So again, this is permanent dipoles attracting. Uh, and this will last uh, quite, I mean, so the uh, London dispersion forces last, you know, 10 to the minus 9 seconds. Very, very, like, boom, it's done. Um, these ones can last quite a bit longer because they're permanent dipoles. Uh, and so there's kind of, you know, molecules are always flipping around, rotating, moving around. Uh, but, you know, chances are these will kind of hang around for a fair bit of time. Okay. Our third one then is called hydrogen bonding. Alrighty, and we're going to see that this is a special. Dipole dipole interaction. And we're going to see it when H is bonded to nitrogen, oxygen, or fluorine. One of these three. Because these are, are kind of most electronegative elements, right? Um, some books will include chlorine um, as one of these, but we typically don't. So um, it's only when we're going to see... Um, so Ali, with that... Um, we kind of wanted to illustrate the different halves of the molecule. If we split it in half the other way, um, we're not going to very easily see a positive half and a negative half. So we're going to kind of be cutting right through the positive and right through the negative. So uh, because we want to 
kind of illustrate the differences between them, we want it to not be a symmetrical, like, cut in half. Oh, okay, but I think I, I'm going one step ahead of you. So you're just trying to identify if it's polar or not. Um, it's definitely not symmetrical, right? We can look at this molecule. Um, we can see that we have lone pairs on it. That's one thing that will tell you right away uh, it's definitely a polar molecule. But let's look at it further. Uh, in order for the symmet symmetry test to pass, it has to be symmetrical no matter what way you cut it. So if you can cut it in any way that you're going to get different things, uh, that's going to tell you that it is going to be polar. So something like, for example, uh, I'm just going to do this way down here. If we take a look at this guy, no matter which way we cut it, it's always going to be symmetrical. We can cut it that way, we can cut it that way, we can kind of cut it to this weird angle right here. You know, no matter what way we do it, it's always symmetrical, so this is going to be non-polar. Non-pa. No, non-polar. Yeah, so that's, that's kind of what I meant there. So, yeah, but still, good question. So, yeah, we have to keep kind of trying until we see something that uh, is not symmetrical anymore. But again, um, just look for lone pairs is the easiest way. <laughs> okay, so back we go. Okay, cool. So there's some things that we need to remember. <clears throat> so the first one, hydrogen is not electronegative kind of meant to write that below, but that's okay. Uh, and another thing to note that hydrogen is very small, right? Uh, it's one proton, one electron, pretty small little thing. Um, and so if we want to look at this, we can see that <clears throat> here's our happy water molecule. Uh, we of course know that hydrogen being uh, less electronegative is going to be the positive one uh, and oxygen is going to be our negative one. And so because these hydrogens are really small, if we look at this second water molecule See which color haven't I used? Light blue, okay. We're gonna see because H is so small, the negative side of another molecule can get very close. So um, definitely in the last example, we had sulfur dichloride. Um, and so, oh, this is super cute. I have three chihuahuas all on one bed, despite all these other beds that nobody is lying in. Uh, so that's kind of cute. But anyways, using the other camera, so I can't show you guys. Um, so because those hydrogens are super duper small, the next, the oxygen for the other molecule can get in pretty close to it. Uh, the the um, chlorines in this last molecule are, by comparison, pretty big. Um, and so that carbon will not be able to really get in there just because those chlorines are so big. If we want to think about them as like, like spheres, here's our sulfur dichloride. And so this other carbon can only, you know, get so far in there before, you know, it just can't fit, essentially. However, if we look at the water, consider hydrogen being super duper small, this other molecule of water can get right up, I'll be 
make it even closer. This water molecule can get super close because those hydrogens are just tiny, tiny little dots. And so, uh, let's see, I use light blue for our interaction. Okay. So they're just kind of, you can kind of wedge yourself right in there and get really close. Uh, and so we're going to see that because of this, because they can get really close, it's a stronger direction. Think about it like magnets. You know, you've got uh, positive in, or north and south poles of magnets, right? They attract each other. You know, uh, the closer you can get those two magnets to each other, the stronger they're attracted, right? Um, you know, as soon as you get magnets close enough, they'll like immediately, you know, smash together, right? And like, the further you pull them apart, the less attracted they are to each other. Uh, and it's kind of the same thing here. So the closer that we can get these uh, molecules to each other, the more their dipoles can interact. So remembering that the oxygen, by comparison, pretty big uh, and negative, is going to get uh, nice and close to those small little hydrogens in the next molecule. And we're going to see this is the case for any time you have hydrogen bonded to nitrogen, oxygen, or fluorine. So for these three elements, if you have hydrogen on them, you're going to have hydrogen bonding taking place. So uh, and again, because these other these three elements, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, are pretty electronegative, and hydrogen is not very electronegative, this means that we have uh, stronger dipoles, right? And so it's a stronger interaction. All right, so does that make sense? So for those two reasons, because the hydrogen is so small and as well as the fact that it is not very electronegative, um, if we stick a hydrogen on an electronegative atom, uh, that's going to allow the molecules that result to be able to get really close to each other uh, and have pretty strong interactions. So this is a strong intermolecular force. Um, and it, as you go into biology, you're going to see this is one of the biggest uh, reasons that you know life can exist, actually. Um, so many of our proteins depend on hydrogen bonds to uh, kind of um, become attracted to each other that cause them to fold in certain shapes, which allow them then to uh, you know have the function that they need to make life happen. So all the, you know, enzymes and channels and, you know, all that sort of thing all depends on these hydrogen bonds. Very important stuff. Okay, so as you can see here, we've gotten like more and more specific. So the first force we talked about, anything can do it. The second force is polar molecules only. And the third force is going to be polar molecules that have a hydrogen stuck on nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine. So we have kind of more and more specific uh, cases as we go. Any questions on hydrogen bonding? I might not have said it explicitly, but yes, uh, if you have an H bonded to one of those three elements, it's going to have to be a polar molecule. I mean, that's um, no way around that. So uh, that's always going to be the case. Okay, I have to take a picture of the dogs. Hold on. I will allow questions.
I'll post it in Discord so you guys can see. But it's super cute. But I'll, no, I don't want portrait mode. Go away. Okay, it'll be in Discord for you guys so you can watch it or rather see it. Yay, super cute. Alrighty, no questions on hydrogen bonding? Alrighty. Then we're going to go to the last one. So uh, we basically now are going to be talking about what happens when an ion interacts with a dipole. Uh, and remember, ions have permanent full charges, whereas dipoles were permanent partial charges. And remember, we've also already talked about ionic bonding, right? That's full permanent charges with other full permanent charges. So we've already talked about that. Um, not going to necessarily be the case here because we've kind of classified that as, an, uh, as a bond. So this is, uh, again, something that is uh, just an interaction. So it's not really a bond. Like These are much weaker compared to a regular covalent bond or ionic bond, but uh, they are important in either case. So what this will look like, let's say um, I'm just going to give you a little key here for what I'm drawing. Uh, if I want to draw the waters that are interacting with a sodium. For example, when it something dissolves, like salt water. Do we think, or rather, which one do we think is going to be the more likely scenario? The one on the left or the one on the right? It's also okay if you have no clue, but uh, yeah, yeah, for sure. I, I agree, it's gonna be the right side. Um, and so we're going to see, no, not that one, um, because remember the oxygen is the negative part. And so that's the kind of big half of our molecule there. So we're going to see kind of all these like negatives. I'm writing them as full, but these are all partial, right? We're going to see that all of these little negative partial negatives can interact with our positively charged sodium. Um, and in fact, we're going to see it's going to be the uh, same idea for our chlorine. So look, if we make this chlorine instead, <laughs> chloride rather, uh, now it'll be okay. Right, because we have the positive little hydrogens there. What color I use? Green, okay. that are going to be kind of interacting with our negative chloride ion. And so uh, we're going to see that this is stronger, the strongest of all the ones that we've done, um, because we're going to have not only multiple um, things interacting, um, but we're also, again, like the bigger the charge kind of attraction is, um, we saw that with hydrogen bonding, it's because, you know, we had a pretty strong uh, dipole there. 
Like the difference in electronegativity between hydrogen and oxygen is 1.4. Uh, so that's a pretty polar bond. Uh, so the hydrogen is pretty partially positively charged and the oxygen is pretty negatively partially charged. Um, in this case, now we're interacting that with something that's fully charged. And so that's going to be a stronger attraction because instead of now partial charges, we have full charges that we're throwing in there. So... This is going to be very strong now because uh, we have partial charges interacting with um, full charges. So that's going to make this the strongest one so far. Actually, it's going to be the strongest one because this is the last one for us. So, um, did I put a number four on this? There we go. That's our fourth one. Um, this one is going to be, uh, we're going to see this is the reason that a lot of ionic compounds will dissolve in water uh, is because you'll have these ion-dipole interactions. So, the water molecules, which are very polar, are happy to interact with ionic species because these are nice and kind of uh, happy way, uh, you know, the water gets very happy when it can interact with fully charged things. Um, and so this is going to be the reason that a lot of things, oh my God, how cute. Okay, okay, sorry, I have to take another picture. Any other questions so far? Or are your brains all dead from, uh, from your exam. So this one, um, we're going to kind of, we're going to forget about this until chapter eight. <laughs> so uh, this will still, so your next exam would be on six, seven, eight. So uh, don't worry, we'll get to this later. I just wanted to illustrate it right now since we're just talking about all these intermolecular forces. So uh, this we're not going to see again until chapter 8 um, because this requires us to have charged things uh, kind of dissolved in solution. So we'll worry about this one later on. So right now we're just going to focus on the other three. So if we were to kind of put this in a handy-dandy chart, we have uh, London forces, we have dipole-dipole, we have hydrogen bonding. Remember this is weak uh, and they get stronger uh, as I, in the order that I've, I've introduced them to you. And we're going to see that everything can do London forces. Only polar things can do dipole, for, dipole interactions. And this is H bonded to oxygen, fluorine, or nitrogen. So uh, again, uh, we're going from more and more specific as we go down, and we are also talking about things that are stronger. Alrighty, so let's actually see what we can do with this information. So I guess this is kind of two questions, or no, it's still one question. So this question is asking us to look at two ammonia molecules, 
and we want to look at all the forces that ammonia can possibly undergo with a second ammonia molecule. So uh, remember that these have to have at least two molecules or two um, atoms in the case of blended forces um, that are in, uh, those atoms would have to be separate molecules or they'd have to be like separate entities anyway. So um, these always have to have multiples. So anyways, let's think of all the forces that uh, ammonia can undergo. So uh, we can go up to our list here. Uh, we have our three kind of categories. Um, does ammonia fall under the category of everything? Not a trick question. Do we think ammonia can undergo London forces? <laughs> Wake up. What do you think about ammonia? London, yes, no. Ah, you guys are asleep. I'm gonna then spam the chat with emojis. Uh, Sherry, it's... Um, yes, I guess. Here are some Bs for you all. Um, yes, so London forces would be when the electrons happen to go to one side. Here are a bunch of Bs for you. Um, and so, um, yes, but the idea there uh, is everything can do London forces. So ammonia certainly can, right? Anything that has electrons can do it. So, um, ammonia can definitely do London. For sure. And so, if we want to look at the other two, if we want to see can ammonia do dipole-dipole interactions, we have to determine if it's polar or not. So in order to do that, we need to do its Lewis structure. Which we have already done. But uh, of course on your own, if you do not have it like already in your head, you would have to draw its Lewis structure uh, from the beginning. So, is this going to be a polar molecule or not? What do we think? Not a polar molecule? Why do you say that? Why do we think it's nonpolar? Yes, polar. Why do we think it's polar? <laughs> It's asymmetrical, yeah, for sure. If you want to think about, so maybe I can uh, explain the symmetry thing a, a different way. Um, so by the way, the answer is indeed yes, it is polar. Um, but yeah, for sure, we have, 
So let's look at this another way. Anytime we have any different electron domains, it's polar. As long as we have a polar bond anywhere in the molecule. If it has a lone pair, must be polar. must be polar. Uh, if you want to do your symmetry test, boom. I guess I should have drawn it in a not trigonal pyramidal. We can do that. I'll redraw it for our symmetry test. Let's try cutting the molecule in half. Same on both sides, definitely not. A uh, lone pair is not the same thing as a hydrogen, so no dice there. Oh, come on, I have to in delete those individually. But uh, remember, anytime you have a trigonal, pyramidal, or bent thing, it always is polar. Always, 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 always. Anytime you have a lone pair on your central atom, your molecule is polar. So I guess review that stuff. So perhaps you've just dumped it out of your brains after the exam, but you will definitely need that still. So because it's polar, it can do dipole-dipole interactions. And now let's look at our third one. Do we have hydrogen that is bonded to oxygen, fluorine, or nitrogen in this molecule? Yeah, we certainly do. That's the only thing we have. We only have hydrogen is bonded to nitrogen. Uh, so we're going to say for sure this can go through hydrogen bonding. And so uh, we're going to say for sure, yeah, this can undergo that. So to answer this question, we would say these, it can go underscore all three of our forces. So uh, this one will have all of them. I can maybe give you some shortcuts. Um, if you check for hydrogen bonding first, it can definitely do all three of them. So remember that hydrogen bonding is the most specific of all of these. So if you check for hydrogen bonding first, that means all three of them. For London, don't even think about it. Everything undergoes London forces. So just throw that down there like you know immediately the only one that you may have to think about is the the uh, dipole dipole one uh but other than that london yeah just throw it down don't even think about it uh and then the others you'll have to think about Alrighty. so um we will pick this back up tomorrow uh, we will uh, we'll start off by doing another kind of similar question or two like this, and then we'll carry on to like what are the effects of you know what's the point of all this stuff. So um, cool. Uh, it looks like if you guys want, we can maybe do an exam review on Thursday as well. Um, that's up to you guys. Uh, so we'll see. So just throw it in Discord if you do want that. Um, and then we can arrange for that as necessary. Whew. Okay, cool. Okay, in that case, uh, I'll see you guys tomorrow then. All right, take care.